indifferent, as if it didn't happen, as if you expected that to be what the judge said. Because any time there's any confrontation between you and the judge, it shows low status, and that's gonna hurt you in that triangle. That's one of the components that we want you always to have in the courtroom and the jury's perspective is high status. Very importantly, the tone I want you to take with the jury is one of empathy. I want them to feel like you're a good friend of theirs that's trying to help them make a good decision. Because the minute we step into that courtroom, the buyer-seller dynamic is in place. And unfortunately, as attorneys, we are the seller and they're the buyer. Therefore, they're going to filter everything we say through a lens of, he wants something from me. He's trying to persuade me. He's trying to trick me. He's not on my team. We want to crush all that. So we want to show signs of honest empathy to get them thinking both consciously and subconsciously, well, this guy's just trying to help me make a good decision. He's on my team, he's a friend of mine. No combativeness, much trustworthiness, much likability. So how do we do that? Well, most of that's gonna be done through nonverbals. So when you speak, and it's, it's very hard to explain empathy in nonverbals, but you're gonna use very soft, friendly body language, tonality and eye contact, much like you would if you were talking. Say your mom was on the jury, and your best interest is for her to make a great decision. Speak to her that way. Uh, an example of language that you could use to kind of um, give an example of the tonality you want to use is, you know, I, I know this is going to be tough to watch, but you, you really need to watch it. Okay, you're a friend, you're helping them, you're warning them it's going to be tough. You know, you're kind of in the, I know, I know, but you're trying to help, you need to take them there. So you want to be very friendly, likable, and approachable. And when you're an attorney, you're naturally coming in not as likable and not as trustworthy, because in the buyer-seller dynamic, it tells us they're not trustworthy because they want something from us that we don't necessarily want from them. And if we find out we don't want it from them, then it's gonna be completely combative. That's not the case. You wanna come across as someone that is only looking to help. <laughs> I'm passionate about this. That's only looking to help them make the right decision. If you've been in the courtroom for 40 plus years, you've probably figured a lot of these things out and established some of your own best practices. But if you haven't, and if you're looking to still improve, I would suggest you implement some of these. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna greatly shorten the learning curve. Because instead of blind trial and error by you just spending time in the courtroom and seeing different reactions, you're gonna put these best practices into place and see the immediate positive reaction to completely wipe out the curve and be working from the top. Now I would suggest you take a look at some of my other videos because commonalities between charisma, influence, persuasion, social dynamics are universal, whether you be in the street, at the grocery store, on a date, or in a courtroom. So there's a lot of commonalities that I would suggest you look for. And also, when someone's considering coming to you and you're considering taking someone's case, a lot of these mannerisms, trustworthiness, likability, high status, intelligence, are attributes that they wanna see before they even decide if you're going to take their case. Don't be one of those attorneys that's scraping to get by for 40 years. Be the guy that can charge what he wants, whose book is full, and start to have some impact in the courtroom. If you own a television or have ever seen a courtroom movie or TV show elsewhere, you've undoubtedly seen countless outrageous Hollywood-style objections. Objections have a somewhat technical process, and if you go to trial, you'll probably encounter objections or need to make some of your own. We're not going to lie to you. Making objections is kind of fun, and it teaches you how to think on your feet. Parties make objections at trial to prevent their opponents from introducing or eliciting improper evidence, or to address inadmissible or prejudicial testimony by a witness. The point of the objection is to pause the trial and have the judge rule on the objection. If the judge sustains the objection, that means the objection was proper and the question pending or testimony given is inadmissible or otherwise improper. 
If the judge overrules the objection, the witness may answer the question pending. If you fail to object at trial, you likely won't be able to raise the issue on appeal. Likewise, if you object too late, the judge may overrule your objection. Depending on your jurisdiction, and equally important, the judge, this might depend on whether you object before or after the witness answers. Sometimes the witness answers too quickly, or the witness's answer itself is objectionable. In those cases, the judge usually gives the objecting party a bit more leeway. On the other hand, if the objecting party did have enough time to object, the judge may overrule the objection. Objections can be made at any time, from opening statements, direct examination, cross-examination, or even closing arguments. Here are a few tips for making objections. As we discussed, be timely what the basis of the objection is. Here are some examples. Objection, Your Honor. Calls for hearsay. Objection, Your Honor. Irrelevant. Objection, Your Honor. Vague and ambiguous. Objection, Your Honor. Improper character evidence or improper. If the judge wants you to explain your position or respond to your opponent's objection, he or she will ask you to do so. Ask for a sidebar if appropriate. Depending